This is lecture two for lesson four. So good spatial analysis can tell you a whole lot. You can learn from your spatial data, you can make decisions with it, but bad spatial analysis can be really misleading and hard to spot by the untrained eye. Maps tend to come across as objective and factual to most normal people, which means that you have a responsibility as a map maker to make sure that your analytical products are actually consumable by normal people and that they're not telling lies. So one major place that people get caught up is that Spatial correlation does not imply causation. Just because two things co-occur near each other doesn't mean that they're causally related. Just for example, I live in Center County, Pennsylvania, where 18.9% of the people living here live under the poverty line, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. Therefore, I can conclude that universities are terrible for jobs in the economy, and we should get rid of them. We should wipe universities off the face of the earth. Maybe MOOCs will be responsible for that. Ooh. But that's not true, right? I mean, universities are not causing the poverty to exist. That doesn't make any sense. In fact, what's happening is that most of this 18% of the people living on the poverty line are students who don't report hardly any income, right? That's because they're being supported by parents or maybe just part-time jobs or, in the worst case, student loans. So there are a lot of factors that can explain that pattern. It has nothing to do with the spatial proximity to uni university in that sense. Another more serious pattern is one we've played around with a fair bit here at Penn State, and that's looking at something crazy, which is the correlation between lung cancer mortality and mean annual precipitation. And if you look at this bivariate choropleth map here, you can see how this pattern plays out. Basically, the way to interpret this is the dark places are high in both variables, high in precipitation and high in lung cancer mortality. This pattern was originally discovered by Dan Carr from George Mason University, who was doing some work with cancer data and looking at covariates, things that vary along with cancer mortality, to try to see if anything explained patterns of high mortality. And if you filter this map to look at just the places that are high in both mean annual precipitation and lung cancer mortality, you can see this kind of view, which shows a lot of counties in the deep south United States, along the Mississippi River, for example, in the southern part, uh, that are high in both of these things. So what's going on here? Is rainfall causing uh, higher lung cancer mortality? No. No more than lung cancer is causing more rainfall to exist, right? It just turns out that rainfall is conflated with the presence of a lot of other explanatory variables in these places. These tend to be rural counties with smaller populations that have lower access to health care, lower educational attainment, worse poverty situations, all that kind of stuff. That is what's actually playing a role here. It's just that rainfall happens to also co-occur in those places. It's not causal. Another really important thing to consider is that scale matters. Depending on the scale at which you analyze things, you might be able to derive completely different results and show people totally different maps. In geography, we call this the modifiable aerial unit problem or MALP, which is also the, also the toughest Pictionary prompt ever and the sound a cat makes before launching a hairball. Let's look at an example. This is a map showing solar potential, so how uh, possible would it be to, uh, and sustainable would it be to put solar panels on your house, for example, and re recoup the cost. This co uh, is from, from the National Renewable Energy Lab in the United States. This shows state-level data here. So we've got Texas all being excellent and Oklahoma being excellent. And even Florida is very good, which is kind of amazing, because Florida is usually not very good at anything. So this map's fine, right? We can make a decision with it. If I live in Nevada, I will just go ahead and buy some solar panels. And if I live in, uh, let's say, Washington State or uh, Michigan, I might as well just quit. But let's look at it at a county level. It's the same data. This is the data that was used to make the state stuff. Now I've got a totally different picture here, right? There's some counties, uh, for example, in South Carolina that look pretty good. Uh, there's one county that looks decent in, uh, in uh, Montana. Um, some of the counties in New Mexico are not in the perfect category, so that's interesting. And even eastern Texas is only good. So what do we do with this stuff? Well, let's look at another level. This is what the original data was. And this is just gridded data that was developed by NREL in the first place, from which everything else in these maps had been derived. And what you can see here is that there are places in Montana, and uh, southeastern Montana, for example, that look pretty darn good but they get washed out when you try to average everything out by counties. And then furthermore, when you try to average it all, all out by state. So this is a good example about how scale matters in terms of how you can make decisions with geography. Another thing you've got to do is you've got to map rates, not totals. Almost anything you can imagine measuring about people and society will be population dependent. This means that a map that isn't normalized is just going to highlight populated places. You're just going to see more stuff happening where there are more people and that's kind of dumb to show. Normalization will calculate rates of occurrence as a proportion of overall populations, and that's what you got to do. 
So if you have data for every U.S. county that counts the number of smelly dogs that live in that county, you would need to divide that number by the total number of dogs in each county in order to come up with a rate, a stink rate, for each place. But let's do a serious example, too. Let's look at the number of vacant houses in the United States by county. So this is lower 48 United States. So if you look at this map, what you'll see here is that there are only a small number of counties that are in the highest category, and they're kind of small and hard to see. And that's because we're just showing the total number of vacant houses, and when we look at the highest categories, that's just going to be where there's lots of houses, so major U.S. cities. We haven't really learned anything from this map, right? We just know that there's, where there are more houses, there are also more vacant houses. Well, duh, that's no fun. So let's now normalize this data. We've taken this census data now, and we're going to look at vacant homes per 1,000 people. So now we're going to say, let's look at the number of vacant houses per population, and then see if there's anything interesting coming out from that. And when you look at this map, you've got a completely different pattern, right? You've got a lot of places that are, um, have lots of vacant homes per population, per person, in the Midwest and Plain States. And you've got this interesting pattern happening in northern Michigan, northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, where there seems to be kind of like a band of counties where there are lots of vacant homes per person. And that's pretty interesting to me. I think it probably has a lot to do with recreational housing, so people who build like fishing cabins and leave them for a while, and they get counted somehow as vacant homes. But I'm interested in what your interpretations of this map might be, so why don't you post something about it in the forums?